to help facilitate a joint approach which best serves local residents and road users alike. Thank you. That ends uh, questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 10353 in the name of Joanne Lamont on Scotland's future. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I call on John, sorry, I, I now call on Joanne Lamont to speak to you and move the motion. Ms Lamont, you have 14 minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And in opening, may I uh, move the motion in my name? Presiding Officer, earlier this week I joined with my colleagues in the Scottish Conservatives and the Scottish Liberal Democrats to pledge more powers for Scotland. The people of Scotland now know that whatever the result of the referendum, there will be change, and the choice is one between separating off on our own completely or continuing to share power with our neighbours where we believe it is in our interest to do so. The debate over more powers for Scotland is an interesting one, whether those powers come to a devolved parliament or an independent one. And it is a debate which has been allowed to dominate Scottish politics over the last period. But we should not allow it to distract from the significant powers we already have at the Scottish Parliament. I believe the key areas to realising our ambitions for Scotland already lie in Holyrood, and it is the Scottish Government which has the power to set these priorities. Education the ability to teach, train and skill up our young children and young people to take their chance to drive a new changing economy and give those who lose their job the opportunity to retrain for the next one. And health, the means to ensure our sick, our vulnerable and our elderly are supported and cared for with the respect and dignity we would want. And to building a Scotland where people have the physical and mental health to take up the opportunities we would create for them. Too often we spend our time in this parliament debating about what we can't do and not enough time talking about what we can do. For some time, this Parliament has failed to be a forum for radical new ideas on improving educational standards or closing the gap on health inequalities. And it will not be, it will not be that until we get past the constitutional question. But issues over schools and hospitals are still a key factor in the referendum campaign. That's because people will be asking themselves whether a yes vote or a no vote will be best for public services. I believe a no vote gives Scots the best of both worlds. Schools and hospitals delivered by a Scottish Parliament, but backed by the economic security and stability of the United Kingdom, allowing us to invest in our priorities. I'm sure that my yes colleagues would argue that there would be more money to spend on the things that matter in an independent Scotland. The economics of independence have long been debated by both sides and as a key area in this campaign will do so again. Members of the Scottish public, the people who will come together to decide our future on September the 18th, will have to choose between which side they believe, whose arguments make the most sense and what fits in best with their view of the future. People often bemoan having to make a choice at all between these competing arguments, between competing facts. They see politicians setting out seemingly contradictory positions, apparently arguing black is white, and are left wondering who to believe. They cry for good, impartial information. They want to hear unbiased, unvarnished facts, which will allow them to make the key decision on behalf of their families. Yet there may never have been a vote in Scottish history where people have had more information, in fact, a small industry has been set up to analyse the consequences and ramifications of this imaginary world, which may never happen. And the key question they all wish to determine, would Scots be better off or worse off if Scotland voted to leave the United Kingdom? The fact that this is debated at all il illustrates how difficult it is to pick through the assumptions and predictions, but many have tried. So let's look at what some of the experts, the economists and the think tanks say. The Institute of Fiscal Studies says, and I quote, our calculations suggest that an independent Scotland could expect to be running a deficit of around 5% of GDP in 2016-2017, which would be larger than that facing the UK as a whole and would necessitate tax rises or spending cuts. The Centre for Public Policy in the region say, quote, there will be a net fiscal loss under independence looking into the future. Citigroup says, with the recent drop in oil revenues, Scotland's fiscal deficit is now significantly above UK levels. The Pensions Policy Institute says a future Scottish Government would need to raise tax, cut spending or accept higher debt. 
Brian Ashcroft, Emeritus Professor in Economics at the University of Strathclyde, says Scottish Government outlays would rise. That would mean additional borrowing or a diversion of spending from investment in the people of Scotland. Martin Wolfe, CBE, Chief Eco Economics Commentator for the Financial Times, says to avoid the risk, it would need to lower its debts quite rapidly. This would require even greater austerity than in the UK as a whole. Given its close ties to the rest of the United Kingdom, Scotland could not get away with taxing corporations or skilled people more heavily than its neighbour. So the bulk of this extra austerity would surely fall on public spending. So I believe a consensus is growing among these financial experts that Scotland would be worse off and there would be less money to spend on the things that matter. On the one side, we have professors, economists, academics, policy experts, all saying the same thing. Scotland would be worse off. On the other side, we have a group of people arguing the opposite. Alex Salmond, Nicola Sturgeon and John Swinney. They say they like independence, but the last thing they will listen to is independent experts who examine their plans. Absolutely. Presiding officer, here is the central deceit at the heart of the nationalist case for independence. The belief that the land of milk and honey is possible mm. simply with a yes vote. You want tax cuts? You can have them with a yes vote. You want better childcare? You can have them with a yes vote. A new industrial strategy? Just vote yes. Every day, the SNP's offer grows larger and larger, suspending the rules of arithmetic with every promise and pledge. But here is the reality, as confirmed by the leading financial experts and economists who have looked at the costs. If Scotland were to vote yes, not only would the first government of this newly independent country not be able to deliver the litany of wonderful things that Nicola Sturgeon and her colleagues promise every day, they wouldn't even be able to deliver what we have now. Rather than improving public services... After that litany, thank you for taking the intervention. After that litany of, of how poor we're all going to be, can you tell me what the trade position is of Scotland and the trade position is of the UK? John Lovett. If you had listened to what I'd said, you will know these are independent experts. Independent experts. And we know how good the SNP are at plucking a figure out of the air, doubling it, pretending nobody else has to do the sums. Your sums do not add up. If Scotland was to vote yes, as I've said, you wouldn't even be able to deliver what we have now. Rather than improving public services in an independent Scotland, they'd be worse if we cut our ties with the United Kingdom. Let us take the figures supplied by the IFS. The think tank Alex Salmond often quotes when it suits his argument. The IFS estimates in 2016, if there was a yes vote, an independent Scotland would face an additional deficit of £4.7 billion. Our deficit would be twice the rate of the United Kingdom. It would leave an incoming Scottish Government facing three options. Borrow even more money to run this inflated deficit, but given borrowing costs for a newly independent Scotland would be much higher, that option would not plug the fiscal gap. And of course, if we were in a currency union, we would have to get a foreign Chancellor's permission first. Alternatively, the Scottish Government could do something Alex Salmond has never considered before, and that would be asking business or the rich to pay more tax. But given his key policies for an independent Scotland are to keep the higher tax rate at 45 pence and slash corporation tax for big business, there seems little chance of that. Mr McDonald, I think you can sit down. Ms Lamont. It is more likely to fall on hard-working Scots to pay for his referendum promises. If Scotland's 2.5 million workers were asked equally to shoulder this additional burden through tax increases, it would mean an additional £1,700 tax bill for each of them. It seems inevitable that we would face public service cuts, cuts to schools and hospitals. Rather than having to find all of these cuts... I thank the member for giving way. Can she guarantee that if we stay in the UK, the Scottish budget will not be cut? John Lawrence. Certainly if there's a Labour government back in power. <laughs> and we know... Order. We know...
know, Order. we know how desperately the SNP backbenchers are praying for a Conservative Absolutely. victory in 2015. Absolutely. Always, always, always their own interests ahead of the interests of the people of Scotland. Rather than having to find all of these cuts, just think what £4.7 billion extra to spend could do for Scotland. £4.7 billion is equivalent of 150 nurses, the equivalent of 125,000 teachers, more than 500 primary schools, 184 secondary schools, 74 hospitals, more than we could ever need. You have to ask yourself, why would anyone want to do that to their country? But this is the proposal which the SNP government has put to the people of Scotland. Unsustainable borrowing, swinging tax increases or deep cuts to public services or perhaps a mixture of all three. All of the experts agree one of these three options or a mixture of all of them are inevitable in the first budget of the government of an independent Scottish state. The Scottish Government's answer to all of its financial problems, of course, lies at the bottom of the North Sea, a revenue for which they can uniquely predict. Ignore the experts. John Swinney's magic calculator can make the numbers add up. But even that illustrates the precarious footing in which the SNP Government would place the public services we cherish. This year's JERS figures show that oil revenues dropped by £4.5 billion in the last year, more than our whole education budget. Only a government as reckless as this, one whose one and only goal is to achieve independence for its people, would risk the education of our children and the care of our sick and elderly on a commodity as volatile as oil. Presiding officer, we already live in a country where you can't go to A&E in Aberdeen and you'd be best advised not to give birth to a child in Wishaw. Now they will have to dramatically cut health spending on top of that. Order. You have to confront the real world, Order, not Mr. your Neil. fantasy world that you've been living in for the last two years. The party which sided with Thatcher, the party which said Scotland didn't mind her economics, the party which sided with the people who said unemployment was a price worth paying, are now saying there is no price, no price too high for Scotland to pay for separation. A deficit more than double the rate of the United Kingdom. That'll be fine. Losing more than the entire education budget, a mere bagatelle. Losing thousands of nurses, Scotland can afford that. The truth of the matter is that the nationalists think they will liberate Scotland. Instead, they will impoverish Scotland. The truth is, the truth is, no one joined the SNP to improve public services. They joined to separate Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom. And they are so determined to do that, they will say anything about anything else because everything is a side issue to the main event. Presiding officer, Scotland's public services face two futures in September 2014. A future after a yes vote where all the experts agree will face renewed austerity over and above what we currently face and cuts to schools and hospitals as a consequence. Or we could face a different future if Scotland votes no. We know that the best future for our schools and hospitals is one where we can make the key decisions here at the Scottish Parliament, but backed by the economic security and stability of the United Kingdom. The best future is one where we in Scotland decide what is best for our young people's education and our NHS, but share the costs across 60 million people rather than six. Pooling and sharing resources, spreading risk and sharing reward, that is the argument that is persuading the majority of Scots that a no vote will give us the best of both worlds. I now call on Nicola Sturgeon to speak to and move amendment number 10353.3. Ms Sturgeon, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I very much welcome today's Labour debate. Uh, Joanne Lamont said in her opening speech that one of the key questions in this debate is whether yes or no is best for our public services, and I very much agree with that. So this debate is very timely, I would say, coming as it does on the very same day that another senior Labour figure, the vice convener of Unison in Scotland, has declared for yes. Uh, Stephen Smiley's backing for independence comes hard on the heels of Pat Kelly 
senior Labour activists and former president of the STUC, Jamie Kerr, vice chair of Renfrewshire South Labour Party, and Anam Kaiser, the general secretary of Muslim Friends of Labour. All of these people, together with people like Alec Mawson, Charles Gray, Carol Fox, Bob Thompson, understand that independence is the best route to a fairer Scotland. And who knows, independence may also be the best route to a reinvigorated Labour Party. And on the evidence of today, the Labour Party in Scotland badly needs reinvigorated. So all in all, presiding officer, Joanne Lamon really couldn't have picked a better moment to demonstrate how increasingly out of touch she is with her own supporters. Uh, but the real reason I welcome this debate is that it gives me, against the backdrop of building momentum for yes, the perfect opportunity to set out again the positive case for Scotland becoming an independent country. Yeah, yeah. To set out, firstly, the evidence that says we can more than afford to be yeah. a successful independent country. Let's just remind ourselves uh, of the facts in the midst of the doom and gloom and woe that characterised Joanne Lamont's speech. An independent Scotland would be the 14th richest country in the OECD, four places above the UK, so not worse off, as the depressing Labour motion says, but better off. We generate more output per head than Japan, than France, than the UK itself. For every single one of the past 33 years, we've generated more tax per person than the UK as a whole. And over the past five years, our public finances have been stronger than the UK's to the tune of £8.3 billion. Pounds. Yes. Gavin Brown. I'm grateful for, for giving way. And saying we'd be the 14th richest, does the uh, Deputy First Minister not feel a little bit silly for saying in the white paper that we would be the eighth. I think the First key point here is that the relative advantage of Scotland over the UK is absolutely maintained. And I don't know whether the Conservatives think it's silly to point out the inherent wealth of this country. I actually think it is a good thing to point out the inherent wealth. And if they spent more time talking up Scotland rather than talking it down, maybe they wouldn't be in the dire position they're in. Scotland can be independent, not at the moment. Of that, there is not a shadow of doubt. But the question on the ballot paper is not can we, the question on the ballot paper is should we? Uh, and on Monday of this week, the Scottish Government published a draft independence bill. And as Joanne Lamont has said, on the same day, uh, the opposition parties made a joint statement on further devolution. And Joanne Lamont's right, what a contrast. Our bill showed how Scotland, with all the confidence and all the powers of an independent nation, could set our aspirations for this nation, work towards fairness in our society, remove nuclear weapons from our soil. By contrast, what the opposition parties offered the people of Scotland was a pig in a poke. No agreement on specific powers to be devolved. Not even one. No indication of timetable. No say for the Scottish people and no guarantee that anything whatsoever will be delivered. That's not good enough. The only guarantee, presiding officer, of more powers is a yes vote. A yes vote to enable the people who live and work in Scotland to decide how this country is run. Not just in the areas that Westminster chooses to devolve, but in the whole range of government activity. Taxation as well as education, welfare as well as health, foreign affairs as well as justice. To take responsibility for our own future, to give us the powers to address the challenges we face and to maximise our own opportunities. I think, not at the moment, I think the founders of the Labour Party will be turning in their graves to listen to Joanne Lamont today, yeah. not just yeah. at her opening statement, which I want to repeat just in case anybody missed it. Joanne Lamont said, today I join with my partners in the Conservative Party. Yeah. But what they'll really be turning in their grave at is the depressing, dismal lack of ambition in the Labour motion. It talks Scotland down. I'm coming on to you, Miss Goldie, so be patient. It talks Scotland down in virtually every line. Joanne Lamont. If you knew about the proud history of the Labour Party, you would know about solidarity and cooperation across the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, Not solidarity. Order. 
with the people of Belfast, Cardiff, Newcastle, who share the same problems as we do, not separating ourselves off them and blaming them for our problems. I know that the proud history of the Labour Party has been betrayed by Joanne Lamont day in and day out because the only solidarity she shows these days is solidarity with the Conservative Party. But the dismal lack of it, no, I'm, I'm coming to you right now, the dismal lack of ambition in the Labour motion is almost as bad as Annabel Goldie at a debate that I did with her and Joanne Lamont on Friday night when jo uh, Annabel Goldie told the audience what report she thought they should read if they wanted to know, and I quote, just how dependent Scotland really is. Uh, well, Scotland is not dependent, but, presiding officer, if Annabel Goldie is right and Westminster really has reduced us to a state of dependency, then surely it's time to do something about that, because nobody should revel in a state of dependency. Just as we should listen to the real lesson from the experts and the studies that Labour motion refers to, because what they show us are the risks and the challenges that Scotland would face if we stay as we are, if we continue to follow the policies of the UK. Challenges of democracy, demography, inherited debt, public finances, these are the products of the status quo. They are not arguments for keeping things as they are, they are arguments for change. They demonstrate the necessity for this country to become independent, to find our way of addressing these challenges. With independence, Scotland would be a national economy with all of the tools of other independent states, no longer a region of an unbalanced and unequal UK economy, just waiting for things to be done for us and to us. Independence puts responsibility into our hands. So yes, we've published the outlook for our public finances on independence and in the years ahead. They show that on all key fiscal measures, our finances in 2016-17 will be similar to or stronger than the UK, not at the moment, and the G7 countries as a whole. But more than that, what we have set out is how policies to boost productivity, grow our population, increase participation in the labour market, could boost our tax receipts by an additional £5 billion a year. Uh, we've also proudly produce proposals to re-industrialise Scotland, something that once the Labour Party might have found it within themselves yeah, to back and agree with. We've set out how we can use policy levers to strengthen manufacturing, to promote innovation, to encourage trade and investment. All of these aims should be the aims and ambitions of every party in here. And that's what's so dispiriting about the Labour motion. There's no alternative plan to increase employment, to grow the economy or to get our working age population growing. Their only solution to the challenges we face is to leave it to Westminster and hope for the best. Well, that is not good enough. It is the most high-risk approach to Scotland's public finances imaginable. To leave the decisions on our funding to the Treasury knowing that the Chancellor and his opposite number is planning further cuts. To leave the Barnett formula in the hands of the Treasury knowing that senior voices in all parties want to sc cut Scotland's budget by up to £4 billion. Uh, what we offer is the alternative to that. The way to secure resources of Scotland and our public finances is through independence to retain the tax raised in Scotland in Scotland, to retain the benefits of our economic policies so that our investment in infrastructure and childcare results in increased tax receipts and further investment instead of disappearing into the Treasury. Presiding officer, the simple fact of the matter is this. This is a choice between two futures, between hope, ambition and optimism on the one hand and dreary, dismal, depressing outlook on the other. Independence, not relying or being dependent on Westminster, is the best way to secure the future of our economy, our public services and the people of this country. And that's why I'm proud to move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Gavin Brown to speak to and move Amendment 10353.2. Mr Brown, you have six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, back in the real world, let's look... <laughs> Let's look at the document that Nicola Sturgeon was so keen to quote, but less keen to take interventions and questions on. She boasted about what a fabulous document the Outlook 
for Scotland's public finances and the opportunities of independence actually is. She talked about how this document proved that on every conceivable measure, an independent Scotland would be richer, would have healthier finances than the rest of the UK. What Nicola Sturgeon didn't say, and what the document doesn't say at the beginning, and what the document only says, tucked away in a box halfway through on page 26, is this. Every single scenario in that document relies upon what's called scenario four of the Scottish Government's oil and gas projections. Scenario four believes that you would get six point nine billion pounds of revenue from oil and gas in the first year of an independent Scotland, rising to seven point three billion pounds the year after. On any analysis, Deputy Presiding Officer, that is an optimistic scenario for oil and gas. Yeah. It is a full four billion pounds higher than the central scenario of the Office for Budget Responsibility. They predict, they predict. Now, it's, it, it's, it's funny, every time you mention the OBR, you get a scoffing from the SNP and you get Alec Neil of all people saying they're very reliable that lot. And Hamza Yusuf, Yusuf shouting out loud. But let's then just take a second to look at the OBR projections. Sure, okay, sure. Hamza Yusuf to re-forecast just about every forecast that's made. Uh, why on earth would he put his responsibility, why would he put his responsibility in an independent body that has managed to get wrong the figures of, the, of his own government in the UK and rely Alan on those? Brown. Deputy Presiding Officer, he absolutely walked into that one because he says you can't, you can't rely on the OBR. Well, let's look at who got it right for the most recent set of oil projections. For 12-13, the OBR were very close to the actual output of what we got. The Scottish Government were almost, uh, they won't like this Deputy Presenting Officer, but it's true, the Scottish Government were out by almost a billion pounds, despite making the projection three weeks before the end of the financial year. So we will take no lessons from the SNP when it comes to projections around oil or anything else for that matter. In just a moment. But let's look also for the oil figures for 13-14, because we know, because we're at the end of the financial year and we've had the projections uh, apart from the final ones, we know that the OBR's projections for oil for 13-14 again were just about right. And the Scottish Government this time were several billion pounds out in their projections. So when it comes to having a track record on oil projections, they may scoff at the OBR, but they are far better and far more successful than the Scottish Government projections have been so far. Now, I promise to give way to Chick Brody, so I will do so. Chick Brody. I wonder if he would care to comment on the statement from the PIRA Energy Group yesterday that Brent crude prices will average higher uh, to $115 per barrel and also the Economist Commodity Index produced last week on oil prices that have arisen 9.5% in the last year. Evan Brown. But the issue is this, Deputy Presiding Officer, for John Swinney's projections to come true, we need oil to stay high every single day of the, that financial year and the financial years afterwards. And we need production to remain high and not to go down. And they rely upon investment costs and production costs being lower than those that are projected. We need to roll a six with every roll of the dice on oil for John Swinney's projections to be true. Now, I noticed he hasn't challenged me once on the projections that I've talked about. They, every single piece of, uh, every single line in this document relies entirely on it being £6.9 billion pounds in 1617 and 7.3 the year after. Far higher, as I said, than the OBR, but higher even than the projections of the Scottish Government's own advisor in their Fiscal Commission Working Group, Dr Andrew, or Professor Andrew Hughes-Hallett, in one second, who said it will be between four and a half and five billion pounds. So Mr Swinney is two billion pounds above even his own trusted expert advisor, who I questioned several times, is that a reasonable estimate? And he was absolutely certain that was a reasonable estimate. 
which means Mr Swinney's projection is a hugely optimistic estimate. I'll happily give way Members to the in his last Secretary. minute, I'm afraid. Sorry, Mr Swinney. Well, I, I, well, well, my, apologies, my apologies to the Cabinet Secretary for that. I will, I will have a chance and I, I can guarantee uh, to Mr Swinney, I'm happy to give way in my final closing speech to him and he can ask any question he likes on that. But the point is this. They say we are going to be better off and richer, but the only way they have managed to do it to make us look wealthier than the UK is to give a high oil projection for every single year. That is not good enough, Deputy Presiding Officer, and we call on them to republish with a central scenario and a cautious, a central and a cautious scenario for oil Plus instead close, of only please. an optimistic scenario. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now Colin Willie Rennie to speak to and move Amendment 10353.1. Uh, apologies, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, for my rather flushed look um, this afternoon. I've been pitching a tent in the park with Joanne Lamont for uh, Wild in the Park, I hesitate to, to uh, confirm. And any member who's not been over to the, to the reception in the, in the, in the, if they've not been over to the reception in Wild in the Park, I would encourage them uh, to do so so they can get a tan uh, like mine this afternoon. I wish to move the amendment in my name. Also in the sunshine on Monday, on top of Carlton Hill, all three parties that support the United Kingdom stood united for more powers for the Scottish Parliament. And on cue, and on cue the Nationalists, just like they did on Monday, berated us previously for standing together, berated us again on Monday for doing exactly that. What Monday signified was that more powers are on the way. People need to know, people need to know that if they vote no in September, they are not voting for no change, but for more powers that are guaranteed. Each party has a detailed plan to back up their commitment. The Liberal Democrat plan is for home rule in a federal United Kingdom. We want this Parliament to raise the majority of the money it spends so that we can determine our destiny on the domestic agenda while sharing risk with the United Kingdom. And what the Nationalists cannot accept is that this constitutional option is the most popular constitutional option on the table. Far, far more popular than independence, and that is why they deride it so much, because they are so afraid of it. We also want to entrench the Scottish Parliament to make it a permanent constitutional feature. The test for us is this. If the Scottish Parliament wants to do something different for the NHS, for schools, for universities, we can do so. If we want to cut taxes for those on low and middle incomes, like the Liberal Democrats in government at Westminster, then we can do so. And if we want to increase investment in early learning and childcare, like my colleagues at Westminster, then we can choose to do so as well. All this can be achieved while sharing risk with the United Kingdom. And we know from reports that have been published that Scotland will be £1,400 better off each year by staying part of the United Kingdom. That's the UK dividend made up of a variety of different benefits that the Nationalists like to deride, but are the reality of our relationship with the United Kingdom. Maintaining high public spending here in Scotland is something that the United Kingdom can achieve with its broad shoulders, is able to deliver this even though oil revenues are so volatile from one year to the next, halving from one year to the next. This is significant because oil would make up such a large proportion of total Scottish income. That's why oil projections are so important. I'll give way to Patrick Harvey. Um, Harvey. I'm grateful to Mr Rennie. He talked about the UK guaranteeing the future of Scottish public spending. Joanne Lamont, in her opening remarks, attempted to offer a promise that an incoming Labour government would not cut the Scottish budget. Would Mr Rennie at least claim the credibility by acknowledging that nobody in this chamber is in a position to make such a commitment on behalf of an incoming Chancellor in 2015, whoever they might be? Well, I don't know if that intervention was directed at me or directed at Nicola Sturgeon, because the promises that the SNP make for the future as if no cuts will ever be made. For it. Of course, there is volatility in finances, but what you get 
with the United Kingdom is the broad shoulders that can deal with the volatility from one year to the next. And because an independent Scotland would be so dependent on oil revenues, the challenges would be ever so much greater. So what we would see, what you also hear is the scoffing from the SNP benches about the independent OBR. They scoff because they say they are too pessimistic. Listening to the Nationalists, you would think that the OBR was part of some unionist conspiracy to do down Scotland. But what they ignore is that far from being pessimistic, the OBR are optimistic, overstating the oil revenues. So far from being a dark despondent with their oil projections, the OBR are far too cheery. They're far too much looking on the upside. And now it is confirmed also by Professor Andrew Hughes Hallett, who also agrees with the OBR that the SNP's projections are far too optimistic. He projects that 30% is the difference between his predictions and the SNP's predictions. That's a mistake of £1.9 billion, at least, potentially £2.4 billion, every single year for the first years of independence. That is a colossal mistake, a colossal overestimate for the problems and the challenges that we would face. So I think we need to have a bit of reality on the SNP benches. I don't blame them for their passion for independence. I recognise that they believe in their cause. I don't criticise them for that. I criticise them for the lack of reality, the lack of honesty about the policies and the costs of independence, Members, in his the last lack of honesty seconds. about the benefits of the United Kingdom, the £1,400 dividend that we get from staying part of the UK. So no more scaremongering about the UK. Let's As talk about close, the upsides, the benefits of staying together. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Very tight for time today. Uh, Mr Macdonald, uh, to be followed by Ian Gray, up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I guess the most we can say about Wally Rennie's speech is that at least he didn't get the Lego out. But can I say, Presiding Officer, that you know, listening to the, the, the quotes from uh, other members in this debate, I want to read a few quotes out to begin with. Supporters of independence will always be able to cite examples of small, independent and thriving economies across Europe, such as Finland, Switzerland and Norway. It would be wrong to say, suggest that Scotland could not be... Not be could be not be another such successful independent country, David Cameron. I believe Scotland is big enough, rich enough and good enough to be an independent country, Ruth Davidson. The question is not whether Scotland can survive, of course it could, Alistair Darling. You'll never hear me suggest that Scotland could not go its own way, Michael Moore. And yet today from Joanne Lamont we've essentially heard the epistle of we're doomed if we become independent. Nicola Sturgeon highlighted a number uh, of Labour members, uh, key Labour members who are backing independence for Scotland. One which she omitted was the Labour MP for Leeds East, George Moody, who has come out and said that Scotland should be independent. How refreshing that a Labour MP representing an English constituency can see independence as the right choice for the nation of his birth and the way he grew up. How sad and depressing that the Labour politicians who are in Scotland cannot see past their antipathy toward the SNP and recognise the possibility that independence could bring for Scotland. Joanne Lamont made the claim that we on these benches did not get into politics to improve Scotland, but instead to impoverish it, which I think is a, a rather unfortunate slight to make. But she thinks that we see independence as an end, not a means, which demonstrates a total misunderstanding. It also overlooks the improvements in public services that have been delivered within this Parliament. And nobody would seek to say that there have not been improvements in Scottish public life as a result of the establishment of the devolved Parliament. But the point is, is that devolution can only take you so far. And when you have a situation where you have a Westminster government which acts against the interests of Scotland, you find yourself in the position of having to mitigate where you can and where you are not able to do so, having to simply thole what is being wrought upon Scotland by Westminster. Now, independence is not a magic wand, but it is a toolkit to improve Scotland, to make Scotland a better place. And in 1997, presiding officer, the prospect was put to Scotland that the decisions 
about Scotland were best taken in Scotland by the people of Scotland on a range of areas, for example, health, education and justice. And that was true irrespective of who the party of government was at Westminster, because that was a Labour Party in power delivering devolution for Scotland in these areas. They recognised that Westminster did not work for Scotland in these areas and that Scotland should take these decisions. So what we seek to do on these benches is simply to extend that maxim, to extend that principle to other areas of policy. Whether that is on Trident, and I was interested to hear Mr Rennie talking about all the things that we could do in Scotland already. One of the things we cannot do is rid ourselves of the abomination of nuclear weapons in Scotland. What we could do with independence and the powers that independence would bring is set that right. Whether it's on issues around welfare and fairness, the, the idea that we have the best of both worlds is an interesting soundbite. But when you actually look at some of the people uh, in Scotland, some of our, our most vulnerable citizens, people who at the moment have a degree of social protection provided to them through the fact that we continue to control our health service here in Scotland. But when these people leave their GP surgeries and enter the clutches of Westminster welfare reform, we are, in, to all intents and purposes, powerless to help them. We can put in place forms of mitigation where we can and where we can do that. We have done so. But we cannot simply suggest that we are in a position to be able to address all of the adverse impacts of welfare reform. The 100,000 children who will be plunged into poverty as a result of welfare reform. We can do some stuff to help those children. We cannot do all of the things we would like to do. We cannot reverse some of the decisions that are being taken. I welcome the approach taken by the expert group on welfare, in particular the comments around the carer's allowance. And I think that for, for so, as somebody who has campaigned for a long time on the, part, on the issue of carers, and in particular the carer's allowance, I think it's very refreshing to see the idea of the carer's allowance, which has been one of the forgotten benefits, I think, uh, being looked at with great seriousness. And I think it doesn't behove the Labour Party, as their spokesperson did at the time, to dismiss that very important piece of work as simply being a bribe. The way this... The idea that if you offer something to people that they don't already have, you're offering them a bribe. No, we're offering a substantial piece of policy regarding a very important group in Scottish, Scottish society. And if Westminster parties decide to deride that as a bribe, of course, one of the things they could do is guarantee similar increases in the carers' allowance within the current system. The fact that they choose not to do so says everything about how the Westminster system operates in relation to those dependent upon the welfare state. In terms, uh, as well, of foreign policy, presiding officer, because we often uh, hear it told that foreign policy is an area where Scotland would not be uh, considered a credible or serious voice. I think that foreign policy is an area where it's not just about your size and it's not just about how loud you shout. It's about what you say, how you act and the alliances that you draw. I'm afraid I'm in my last Emerson 40 seconds. Last 30 seconds. If we look at the contribution, the important contribution that nations such as Ireland and Belgium have played in terms of United Nations peacekeeping missions, nations who are not major players in terms of the defence agenda or this, the wider international security agenda, we have a strong role to play in terms of peacekeeping. If we look at the important role that Norway played in the Middle East peace process through the drafting of the Oslo Accords, we can see that small independent nations who are, uh, use the, the right kind of language in the international scene, who use the right kind of behaviour in the international scene, can have a credible and forceful role to play in foreign policy affairs without needing to be large in size of population Close, or one of the great military powers, as we're often told, we're a part of. The great military powers who get dragged into Thanks conflicts such as Iraq. And look how well that ended up. Thank you. Now call on Ian Gray to be followed by John McAlpine. Thank, thank you, Deputy President Officer. It's a truth universally acknowledged that in this referendum campaign, many voters still feel there is a lack of dispassionate information available about the economic and fiscal position of an independent Scotland, and they certainly didn't get any from the largely substance-free uh, contribution from the Cabinet Secretary. But the truth is that every day sees a growing body of rigorous analysis from academics, think tanks, ratings agencies and major companies, independent of either campaign or indeed either government, and they are remarkably consistent in their views. An independent Scotland would face higher debt, a higher deficit and higher borrowing costs than we do as part of the United Kingdom. Pretty well all of these reports point to higher taxes or greater cuts in public services than anything required uh, while in the UK as a direct consequence of separation. And the scale of cuts in public services we would face is pretty consistent too with the most recent estimate coming from the IFS calculating 
that the deficit in an independent Scotland would be 5.5% of GDP, around twice what we would face as part of the UK. That means we would have to find £4.5 billion of cuts just to stand still. And the answer to Mr Harvey's point, I see he's not there, is that whatever challenges we face as part of the United Kingdom, they would be greater and more acute uh, as a separate country. That is the conclusion of all the analysis. And the extra borrowing that Mr Swinney announced uh, that he plans post-independence earlier this week would simply be swallowed up and we would still find ourselves having to pay off teachers and nurses by the thousand. Yet these figures do not begin to include the costs of the promises the Scottish Government have made with no idea how they will pay for them. £550 million to pay pensions earlier, £1.2 billion to pay for childcare, £300 million or so for benefit changes. And don't forget the windfalls for big business, £380 million for corporation tax cut, up to £230 million to cut air passenger duty, £150 million a year for the energy companies to end their environmental obligations and pass those back on to Scottish citizens and taxpayers. And these figures don't include either the diversion of oil revenue to an oil fund on day one, Mr Swinney says, when even their own white paper admits there is not spare oil money for an oil fund. Nor do these figures include the set-up costs for a new country. Uh, ICAS have estimated £700 million just to set up a tax system. Interestingly, almost exactly the figure Mr Swinney himself estimated in his private paper to his Cabinet colleagues. These are all sums which will have to be cut from public spending, from schools, from hospitals, from local services. Unless, of course... John Mason. I thank the member very much for giving way. I mean, he does portray the, the kind of most negative, it seems. I mean, would he accept that if uh, GDP was to grow by even 1 or 2 per cent, it would cover quite a lot of these figures? Perfect timing, Ian Mr Green. Mason, because, of course, the way out of this would be to believe the Scottish Government's own forecasts which tell us that there would be suddenly more economic growth. They say our productivity will jump, our employment rate will suddenly soar, net in-migration will double and the working age population will boom. The Scottish Government say the OBR can't forecast oil revenues. So, in its place, they've thought of a number, doubled it and added a couple of billion pounds on for luck. They assume that setting up a new country will cost us less than the building in which we now stand, maybe nothing at all. And when they are asked, Mr Mason, where these increases in productivity and employment will come from, they do not know. When they are asked where 24,000 net migrants a year will come from, they do not know. When they are asked what the set-up costs for Scotland will be, they tell us they do not know. When they are asked what will the currency in this country be when there is no currency union? They tell us they do not know and will not say. In response to independent analysis, which says independence will mean cuts to public services, to credit agencies who tell us we'd pay more to borrow, to bodies like the Pension Policy Institute, who say today to our committee that independence would jeopardise the affordability of pensions, the Scottish Government have nothing to offer but a towering edifice of dodgy arithmetic, unfounded assertion and wishful thinking. To paraphrase one commentator this week, it would be pie in the sky, except they don't even have the ingredients for the pie. <laughs> one, of my, one of my local activists summed the independence offer up perfectly. He said to me, it is a gamble funded by a lottery. And this is a gamble with the highest stakes of all. A gamble with our schools, our hospitals, the jobs of our teachers and nurses, the education of our youngsters, the pensions of our older citizens. Last week we saw the news that the biggest political bet ever had been placed on the referendum outcome. But the truth is, the biggest political bet ever in this country is the independence prospectus itself. 
and the stake is the future of our country, the life chances please. and well-being of our people. It is a gamble we do not have to make and a gamble we should resoundingly reject come September. Thank you. May I call on John McAlpine to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It was Samuel Johnson who said our aspirations are our possibilities. What that means is if you want to progress, you have to believe that change is possible. Or to use a phrase popularised by the radical independence movement, our colleagues in Yes and other Scotland is possible. The Labour motion today suggests that the party have no aspirations. That's very apparent. Labour are telling us that change is not possible, and that empowerment is not possible. And I would like to contrast their motion with a number of documents which have been published in recent weeks which envisage the possibilities of a better Scotland in the future. We had Rethinking Welfare, the second report of the Expert Working Group on Welfare, chaired, chaired by Martin Evans of the Carnegie Trust. That set out vision for a fairer Scotland for the most vulnerable people in the country with recommendations on re-establishing a link between benefits and the cost of living, an increase in the carer's allowance, and the recommendation that the first government of an independent Scotland should have as its goal a living wage instead of a minimum wage. Last week, the First Minister unveiled reindustrialising Scotland for the 21st century, a document which showed we could grow our manufacturing output by a third and suggested some very practical ways to deliver that with the powers of independence, for example, through a properly funded Scottish Business Development Bank, simple, more effective tax system and a network of overseas offices designed to boost our exports. And then on Monday, the Deputy First Minister published the Scottish Independence Bill, a consultation on in an interim constitution for Scotland. I must say I found reading the draft constitution an encouraging and indeed a moving experience. In particular, the clarity of the language was inspiring. It began with a simple statement, in Scotland the people are sovereign. And in Clause 3 it said, in Scotland the people have the sovereign right to self-determination and to choose freely the form in which their state is to be constituted and how they are to be governed. So I've mentioned just three of the many documents that the government and others have published outlining a vision of the future, in this case of welfare, of the economy and of the empowerment of the people. All of these documents shared an ambition for Scotland. They met that Samuel Johnson maxim, our aspirations are our possibilities. Another Scotland is possible, something that the Labour Party used to believe. This motion today suggests that they have given up on that belief, given up on ambition and given up on vision. The Labour motion today has no vision for a fairer welfare system. It has nothing to say about growing our economy or truly empowering our people. Instead, the motion talks of the security and stability of the UK, a UK that is paying a billion pounds a week in debt interest repayments. That's neither secure nor stable. The UK government has capped welfare with the support of the Labour Party in Westminster and showing that the UK, in the UK the most vulnerable face a bleak future. The motion suggests that the UK is OK, well that welfare cap is not OK. 100,000 children in poverty by 2020, as the Child Poverty Action Group have predicted, is not OK. A regionally imbalanced economy in which output in London was 70% higher than the UK average is not OK. An income inequality which is amongst the worst in the OECD is not OK either. If that is the best vision Labour has to offer, the people of Scotland should have only two words to say to them. No thanks. Thank you very much. Now we call on Kezia Dugdale to be followed by George Adam. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, Joanne Lamont has well established the case for why the best future for Scotland is one where its devolved public services are delivered by the Scottish Parliament, but backed by the security and the stability of the United Kingdom. My colleague Ian Gray has collated all the substantial evidence which states that Scotland would be £4.5 billion worse off under independence, having to find over £4 billion just to stand still. In the time I've got, I'd like to look at the budget lines around education, how that money is spent, and if I have time, I'll look at the additional promises that the government have made. Four and a half billion pounds is the magic number. It represents the money that we need to find. It's also the drop in oil revenue between 11-12 and 12-13. It's also the entire schools budget. 
I have spent a lot of time knocking doors and taking part in referendum debates, and I have met a lot of undecided voters who are completely scunnered by the way we talk about the country's finances. One side says they would be £1,400 better off, the other £1,000 with independence. They have stuck thinking they're stuck thinking that someone's going to run up to them with bundles of £20 notes without realising that these projections are based on 10, 15 years into the future. If economists can't forecast one year ahead effectively, how can voters take any credence of sales pitches like that? That's why the comparison between oil revenues and schools is such a compelling one. Here's a resource that's so volatile that a dip in its value from one year to the next is enough to wipe out the entire school's budget. Okay. The, the, the comparison is only valid if the member is asserting that oil revenues are all that you would have available to pay for schools when you clearly would not within a budget. I'm merely making the point to the member that this is how undecided voters look at the debate. They're trying to get their head around the finances and his side sums don't add up and they don't add up to the size of the entire school's budget. That's where the size and the security of the UK comes in. The UK can carry that fluctuation in prices with far greater ease than an independent Scotland. The Deputy First Minister, in her motion, references the, government's recommend, references the government's record of delivery under devolution. So let's look at the detail of that in the context of education. Cash term spending on secondary schools is falling. From 2008 to 2011, it fell by £91.4 million. Real term spending on secondary schools is falling too, down 8.6% since 2006 7. Teachers are feeling the pressure, having to deliver more for less. The latest EIS teacher survey, delivered just last week, has some startling statistics. Just one in three teachers are satisfied with their work in life. 84% of teachers had varying levels of work related stress, and just one in 10 were satisfied with their current workload. The resounding message from teachers is that they don't feel heard, they don't feel valued as professionals, and they don't feel they're getting the support that they require. Meanwhile, educational inequality persists, and it's an issue most stark when you look at the experiences of looked after children in Scotland. There was a new report from the Scottish Government this week on looked after children. You'd be hard to find it underneath all the other bump on the Scottish Government website, including proposals for a new constitution. But once again, it shows the complete lack of exposure and priorities from this government on this issue. Let's look at the headline numbers. 85% of looked after young people left school as soon as they were old enough. That compared to 30% of all school leavers. Just 62% of looked after kids had positive destinations after school, compared to 90% of all school leavers. To the government's credit, that's a considerable improvement on 2009-10, but there's still a very long way to go. Where there's less good news is on tariff scores. The average tariff score of a looked-after child in Scotland is 86, whilst it's 407 for all school leavers. That means that kids not in care are outperforming kids in care by a rate of 5 to 1. That's a shocking statistic, but it's not the most damning statistic in the government's own report this week, because the gap is getting bigger. The tariff scores are increasing at twice the rate for kids as they are for looked after children, twice as fast. This matters in the context of today's debate because education is an entirely devolved issue. This is a government who set the priorities and make the hard choices, not the dastardly administration 400 miles down the road, this government. Peter Peacock asked the OECD to investigate Scottish schooling back in 2004. It was a comprehensive and compelling report produced in 2007, showing we had an inequality problem in our schools. This government have completely failed to address it. This record speaks volumes about their commitment to tackling inequality in our schools. The EMA is another classic example. Mike Russell boasts about the increased number of school pupils in receipt of the EMA, but denies the fact that he's cut £10 million from the budget and college students are unable to take it at all. 26% cut in the EMA. What about colleges? 37% reduction in student numbers. And the SNP will say those numbers are wrong, but they fudged the statistics by redefining what a full-time course is. And once again, women disproportionately affected by those changes. And that's before we even get to their childcare commitments, which we believe and SPICE believe cost £1.1 billion. And this government won't produce the economic model, which will tell us where they'll find it. In conclusion, President Officer, this government needs £4.5 billion post-independence just to stand still. 
but they're standing still on the big issues like educational inequality. That tells us everything we need to know about their values and priority. The Deputy First Minister says, look at the record. Well, the record on inequality is way, wafer thin. Why would it be any different with independence? Must close, please, and thank you for closing. Now I call on George Adam to be followed by Animal Goldie. Six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I always welcome the opportunity to discuss Scotland's future. The positive case for independence, as opposed to the negative uh, reasons to stay within the Union, which we continually hear from the opposition parties here at the moment. You know, it's always, there's always a positive uh, idea for us to talk about the values and uh, priorities that an independent Scotland would actually have, because that's what independence gives us. It gives us the opportunity to be able to prioritise, get the full levers of power and prioritise the power to, to, and values that we have to deliver for the people of Scotland. But the eyes of the world are on Scotland. We are, the, we are indeed the, the talk of the international political steamy at the moment, and quite rightly so, because not only is this such an important issue for the people of Scotland, it is also uh, we stand between two futures, a status quo with further austerity cuts in Westminster government that Scotland did not vote for, or the responsibility, presiding officer, of the full powers of government, giving us the opportunity to no longer play the blame game, to blame other political parties, to blame other uh, governments in other places, to take on the full responsibilities of independence and create the type of Scotland that every one of us in this chamber actually wants. We currently live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, yet many of our people do not have the opportunities they need, or worse, li worse still, live in poverty. Westminster's austerity cuts to welfare are making their lives even more difficult. Many of our electorate even have difficulties with dealing with the, the benefits they currently have. What type of Scotland do we want? With independence, we can create a welfare system that supports our people back to work, makes work pay, and provides a strong and decent safety net for those unable to work. I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government is taking on a number of the expert working groups' welfare recommendations, increasing carers' allowance already mentioned by my colleague Mark MacDonald, uh, to the same rate as job seekers' allowance for those aged 25 or over, and also re-establishing the link between benefits and the cost of living, with benefits and tax credits being increased each year by, uh, by the Consumer Prices Tax in uh, Index of Inflation. But most importantly, presiding officer, most importantly, abolishing the bedroom tax Tax, instead of mitigating against the bedroom tax, making sure that we have the powers to be able to do that, replace the current system of sanctions with one that is fairer and more personalised and positive, as opposed to all of us having constituents coming into our offices and being left penniless because of the current system. That's the type of Scotland that I want to live in. That's the type of Scotland I want for the future. Independence can... Yes, I will indeed. Drew Smith. Um, I, I respect uh, the, 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 the passion that the member has for these issues, but why wouldn't he want to have the, the ambition to abolish the bedroom tax for people suffering under it right across the UK? Why that poverty of ambition? My ambition is to ensure that the people of Scotland have the opportunities to create the kind of country that we want. That's the ambition I have for us to be able to collectively take our place in the world. And it's the opportunity to make things easier for parents to get back to work by transferring money spent by Westminster on trident weapons into child cares, investing in wanes, not weapons of mass destruction, ensuring that we can actually take that money and ensure that we can build the type of Scotland getting people back into work when we can. Our childcare policy is already there by the end of the first budget. We will provide 600 hours of childcare to around half of Scotland's two-year-olds. By the end of the first parliament, we will ensure that all three-year-olds, four-year-olds and vulnerable two-year-olds will be entitled to 1,140 hours. These are the things that can make a difference in people's lives, and these are the things that we actually believe will make that difference. Also, it's so independence can give us the powers to invest money raised for enabling more women into work, back into childcare, transforming childcare along, uh, alongside strengthening employability and skills programme, enabling more people, particularly women, back into work. These are the things that make the difference, and these are the things I passionately want to uh, deal with in this chamber, because when we have the powers of independence, we can have that debate, instead of having the usual Westminster ping-pong uh, competition where it's Tory one time, Labour the next, and it's constantly just blame everyone else, instead of actually taking the responsibility, the responsibility of government presiding officer, 
ensuring that we can actually move forward because Scotland currently has a democratic deficit. Westminster will never deliver the future we want because 76% of Scottish MPs voted against further uh, austerity, austerity cuts in the 2010 finance budget. It made no difference. It still went ahead. 81% of Scottish MPs voted against the welfare cuts in the welfare benefits operating system. Presiding officer, an old friend of mine, an old SNP councillor who's now left us uh, in uh, Remshire Council for 35 years, Jim, Councillor Jim Mitchell, used to say you're powerless if you remain within the Westminster system. And indeed, Scotland is powerless if we remain within the Westminster system because we're bigger than that, our ambition is bigger than that, and we want so much more. So, presiding officer, there are indeed two choices we have in front of us, and it's quite simple. Responsibility, the power to deal with the many challenges that we have with independence, for us all, so that we can create the type of country that we all want, an exciting new dawn, or the continued negativity and austerity of Westminster. Recently, presiding officer, I announced here, as a husband, a father, and a soon-to-be grandfather, I know what type of country I want for uh, my family and for Scotland. That's why I believe passionately that independence is the only way forward. So give us the power to create the country Master we all want. Please. That's surely something that everyone in here wants for the future. Thanks so much. Annabel Goldie to be followed by Chick Brodie. Up to six minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm delighted to take part in this de debate because I wholeheartedly believe that the strongest and the most stable and secure future for Scotland is one in which uh, she remains part of the United Kingdom. And as a general and positive observation about that partnership, you only have to look at the current news headlines to understand why in a global world, global influence actually matters. And that is an influence which, with the best will in the world, no matter how well it was led, an independent Scotland could not replicate. And there are many other reasons why Scotland is better off as part of our family of nations. One of the most compelling and obvious is that the United Kingdom allows us to pool and share resources across a population of 60 million people. And without doubt, that is the best way to ensure Scotland continues to be able to invest in schools and hospitals and other public services. And, presiding officer, this point is well illustrated when we look at the whole topic of pensions. Now, put simply, the best way to ensure our pensioners are supported is by spreading costs across these 60 million UK citizens, not just the 5 million population in Scotland. And as Scotland's population is projected to age faster than the rest of the UK, and the proportion of Scotland's population of pensionable age is already greater and projected to increase more rapidly than the rest of the United Kingdom, there can be no doubt, Deputy Presiding Officer, that pensions will become less affordable in an independent Scotland. And I can hear the SNP backbenchers chirping their usual indignation with the mantra, everything will be OK because Scotland is oil and this oil makes Scotland one of the wealthiest countries in the world. In fact, presiding officer, I believe one of the Yes Scotland billboards proclaims, what would you say to living in one of the country's wealthiest nations? Well, we already do. It's called the United Kingdom. And as part of the United Kingdom, Scotland is already a proud and vibrant country in a strong and successful and stable union. And let me, just, let me just make progress. Can I comment on oil and gas, which my colleague Gavin Brown has so eloquently talked about? Oil and gas is a fantastic success story. According to Mr Swinney's leaked memo, it's been essential for funding Scotland's public services over the last 21 years. And even with these revenues, Scotland has still been in deficit in all bar one of these years. These revenues have safeguarded Scotland's public services. The oil and gas sector is an amazing uh, job and revenue creator, and one of which Scotland should rightly be proud of. But in an independent Scotland, oil and gas would be a much bigger proportion of the Scottish economy than it currently is in the wider UK economy. And that should ring alarm bells, because oil and gas tax revenues have been falling since 1999, a fall which the UK economy is much better able to absorb. If we look at just last year, these revenues fell by more than £4 billion. Now, had this happened in an independent Scotland, which would be operating an estimated starting budget deficit of around 5% of GDP, the consequences would have been acute. Either schools and hospitals would have to be shut or taxes would have to rise. But last year, but last year that horrible dilemma did not arise. Why? Because of the economic stability which being part of the United Kingdom gives us. Now compare that with the fiscal position of an independent Scotland in 2016 when the SNP wants us to leave the UK. 
This month, both the Independent Institute of Fiscal Studies and the Treasury publish detailed analyses. And these analyses conclude that an independent Scotland would face more substantial challenges than the rest of the UK. And these analyses suggest that to continue to provide similar levels of public services over the next 20 years, we would need to increase, increase onshore tax revenues by 13% from the start of independence. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think people need to understand what the scale of this increase actually is. This would be equivalent to setting a 28% basic rate of income tax, a 26% standard rate of VAT, and increasing the main duties on alcohol, tobacco and fuel by almost 40% or growing the economy at a rate which is by any assessment impossible. And, presiding officer, these figures do not even take into account the extra borrowing which Mr Swinney uh, announced this week. Nor, presiding officer, do these figures uh, include the set-up costs which an independent Scotland will have to pay for. Now, this is not talking Scotland down. This is just providing facts. And if providing facts means protecting Scotland from uncertainty and unanswered questions, then nobody is going to stop me giving the facts. And if the Scottish Government were saying to the people of Scotland, look... An independent Scotland would face financial challenges and we would lose the safety net of the United Kingdom and there are difficulties, but the dream is worth the risk. But we are going to explain how we'll mitigate that risk. Then, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would have more respect for the SNP's position. Instead, the Scottish Government is completely ignoring the warnings in its own leaked memo. It makes sweeping assertions. It overestimates revenues, it underestimates expenditure, and it refuses to quantify other costs altogether. Now, presiding officer, I don't think that's good enough. In a debate of this magnitude, the public is entitled to a lot better than that. So, presiding officer, I want to protect our public services in Scotland. I want Scotland to have a vibrant, strong, stable and secure future. And the partnership of the United Kingdom offers that in striking contrast to the uncertainty which enshrouds the case for independence. Thank you very much. I now call on Chuck Brody to be followed by Sarah Boyer. Thank you, President Officer. I too welcome the debate this afternoon, but express some amusement at the last part of the motion which states that by sharing its resources with its neighbours, it will mean that the people of Scotland enjoy the best of both worlds. That will be the five London neighbours whose aggregate income is greater than that of the five million UK neighbours on low incomes. These last lines serve to confirm that whoever wrote that, whoever believes that, that lives on another planet. Now, we'll hear a lot, and we have heard a lot about numbers this afternoon, and I will indulge in some later. But it's about more than that. It's about eradicating the democratic deficit that inhabits our neighbouring worlds and planets. The best of both worlds does not include, in my book, and Mr Bibby, this applies to the UK, a bedroom tax, a welfare cap, food, food banks, and so much more. If that's the best, then I hate to see the worst. Presiding officer, what the motion seeks to omit is the real question. The real question, the real issue, is ensuring that the people of and in Scotland have full sovereignty over the matters and decisions which affect their daily lives, that they each and every one, each and every one of them chooses what kind of society they want. And continuing the planetary theme, the Scottish Labour Party, I'm afraid, is a bit like Klingons. It clings on to the hope, the belief, let me, let me carry on just now, the belief that if they stick with Starship Miliband, they will land as a UK Labour government again one day. Under every, under every UK Labour government, it has been a disaster for Scotland, from the coalition of Ramsay MacDonald, the centralising Attlee, to the devaluing Wilson, to the winter of discontent Callaghan, to the illegal warmongering of Blair, and then to the banking recession of Gordon Brown. And now they want to hitch themselves. You want to hitch yourselves to the Tory party, which Churchill once said it was not a party, it was a conspiracy. I didn't believe them in 1979, 1980, and I certainly don't believe them now. On democracy, the message to the people of Scotland is that we should no longer uh, accept the position that only 4.1% of the Houses of Parliament uh, were elected, or in the case of the Lords, unelected and appointed by the people of Scotland. And the Lib Dems should be ashamed of, of uh, approving that. Real security, presiding officer, and stability of our world lies in 
our self-determination and national sovereignty. Now, I said, let's talk numbers, so here's a, a, just a few key numbers. Scotland's rich, not just in its natural assets, but in the assets and the skills of its people, in its trading and its reputation abroad. And let me help Ms Lamont uh, now with the question I posed earlier. Scotland enjoyed a trade surplus, a surplus, of £2.8 billion in 2013, equal to 1.9% of GDP. The UK had a trade deficit, a deficit of £26.7 1.6% of uh, GDP. And this is, there is a consistent pattern. Yeah. Great. Well, the member perhaps acknowledged within those figures that 70% of our trade was with the rest of the United Kingdom and explained to me why creating any kind of barrier with our major customer would be advantageous to that trade balance. I'm afraid that uh, the, the, the dream that, that, that goes uh, through Mr Gray's head is that we're putting up barriers. No one has suggested about putting bar uh, barriers. Anyway, talking about trading ability, it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting that Scotland's net trade position and surplus has grown by 318% if one considers the yearly average from 2007 to 2013 versus the yearly average of 1998 to 2006. And notwithstanding, Ms Goldie, Goldie the downtime in the Elgin oil field in 2012-13, Scotland has had a better current budget balance average over the last five years than the UK. And the same also applies uh, to the uh, current fiscal balance even allowing for the financial treatment of capital spend in 2012-13. So Scotland performs well, and it will get better. It's richer per head than the UK, France, ja Japan, and Italy, and the majority of independent developed countries. However, presiding officer, the debate is not helped by some of the positions taken by the Westminster government based on data uh, produced by the OBR, the Office for Budget Responsibility. It is regrettable in my, in my view that the OBR has not taken the opportunity to engage more fully with the Scottish Government across taxation and revenue streams. That might have helped destroy the view of some, as expressed by Alistair Darling in 2010, that right from the start the Tories used the OBR not just as part of the Government, but as part of the Conservative Party. It has not helped either that the OBR itself confirms, and I quote, its methodologies on tax are work in progress, i.e., they're not proven, and that they, in their own words, were unable to involve the Scottish Government in the stage of the process of determining Scottish tax forecasts for confidentiality reasons. I wonder why. And that, presiding officer, extends also to oil prices and revenues. In its EFO document of March 2014, the OBR itself said, movement in oil prices and the exchange rate means the price of oil is slightly higher than we assumed in December. As you draw that, of close, course, please. has been confirmed this week by PIRA and the Economist Commodity Index, as I mentioned earlier. The presiding officer of Scotland is a wealthy country. The best way in our return to the democratic deficit is to secure the investment in our schools, hospitals and public services. The best way to handle the challenges, the volatilities and the opportunities close, facing our nation, the best way is to accept the people of Scotland are sovereign and let them create the Scotland they wish. Only independence will deliver Thank that. You. Now call on Sarah Boyack to be followed by Dave Thompson. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's always a joy to follow Chick Brodie because I believe that devolution gives us the best of both worlds. It is the best way to ensure a future for our public services, to invest in our schools and hospitals, but it's also been a fantastic platform in Scotland for us to support the expansion of our financial services, our renewables, a market for our food production and the investment we've seen in that, and also support for tourism, all of which have grown and been strengthened with a strong Scottish Parliament working in partnership with the rest of the UK. Okay. And we can do all of that without the division, without the disruption that would come from the uncosted independence plans that the SNP would take us through. Strong devolution is also about living in an interdependent world where no one party, no one institution is all powerful, where we have to work together for the greater good. And that's why we need double devolution too. In our devolution commission, we gave the commitment to support local authorities, to address the issues, to act on housing, to act on employment where our most disadvantaged communities desperately need action to tackle uh, the market failure. Order. 
Thank you. Carry on, Ms Boyer. To tackle the market failure and to tackle the problems that have come from our Tory-led government. Mr it's not Smith. Just, it's not just about new powers. It's also about funding streams and building up capacity and capability as well. It's also about supporting our rural and island communities, giving them the opportunities to do more. So stronger devolution as part of the UK is a much better future for Scotland. And on all of the issues I've just mentioned, the SNP could have acted if they'd wanted to in the last seven years. But I think historians will look back and they will question Alex Salmond's judgment in waiting seven and a half years to have a referendum when he could have got going at the start. And we could have, we could have tested this issue out seven and a half years ago. Look at Donald Dewar, within three months of the Labour government being elected in 1997, we had the referendum, we had a decision, and we were able to get on with exercising power to seek the opportunity to tackle social injustice and to build in solidarity. And that was the legacy of the Blair government. No thank you. In choosing not to act on the bedroom tax in 2013, that decision tells you everything you need to know about the cynicism of the SNP, who could have used the powers they had, who could have looked at how they could help local authorities. And as we predicted, there was a cost to that year of inaction. It left thousands in debt for the first time in their lives. It meant councils and housing associations diverting scarce cash out of investment programmes from improving their housing stock to support tenants. And and it left a sting in the tail that councils are now having to address. Those people who paid their bill, who paid the bedroom tax that when they could ill afford it, who are now aggrieved, and they are having to deal with that reality. So the SNP could have done more. And our local authorities do not have the luxury of playing with politics. They have to take decisions now in the real world. They cannot put dis difficult decisions on hold. Social care um, challenges are here now and increasing. I was speaking to a constituent just on Monday who's worked as a care worker for 23 years and she is on the verge of giving up because of the pressure, because of the lack of time she's allowed to devote to the people that she cares for. And she, she believes, and I think she's right, that her hard work is not valued. And I think that work, the, the work that Unison is doing highlighting the need to tackle inequality and the work we've done with Renfrewshire Council shows what we need to be doing rather than with sticking with a sterile and cynical debate the SNP would push us into. Because we need an urgent debate now about how our local authorities provide and improve quality services that, to the people that need them now. Local authorities need to expand their training. They need to integrate their work and employability and they want to deliver at a local and a regional level to deliver strategies with employers and with colleges that will actually work. That's what they need to do. We should be empowering them to do that, not telling them why they can't do it, not cutting back in the FE sector. At our Scottish Labour Councillors Conference at the weekend, we had a fantastic set of discussions about the work that is being done now by local councillors, even with the challenges that the SNP have put in their way. Consulting with communities, looking at the tough budget choices, shaping their services, and getting on with implementing their manifesto commitments now, despite the centralising and underfunding agenda that they face. There is fantastic work being done in West Dumbarton and Falkirk and Glasgow and Edinburgh to make sure that our young people have real opportunities for training. But there is so much more that can be done. And you only need to look at the local government elections over the last 18 months to see that that work is actually acknowledged by local communities. They don't want their local authorities to be used as a political football. They want people to get on and do the work now. And you can see that there's a challenge that is being met by our local Labour councillors. If you look at the number of seats where Labour has won in the last 18 months, we're currently running 13 to 1. 13 Labour seats won in the last 18 months versus a single seat by the SNP. Some of those by-elections were caused by SNP councillors resigning from the council. That tells you a story. That story has not been debated in here, but one of the things I was delighted to do was to speak with Leslie Macdonald and to communicate with Leslie Macdonald, a South Lanarkshire SNP councillor who's been an SNP member for 30 years who's joined Labour and to welcome Neil McIntyre at the weekend, the first Labour councillor ever elected to Argyll and Butte to serve for Oban South. There is close, something please. happening at the local level. People understand that practical commitment to social justice and social solidarity. We need to be doing more to support that, to get off pause and press play. Let's get on to the 19th of September. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. 
Now, Colin Dave Thompson to be followed by Dr. Richard Simpson. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Annabel Goldie, when she spoke earlier on today, said that she was giving us facts. Now, that's a very interesting point that she made, because obviously she can look into the future and tell the future if she's giving us facts in relation to her projections and the projections of the various other bodies that she referred to. She said that the yes side were making sweeping assertions. And she implied by that, I suppose, that her facts were not sweeping assertions. Well, I would question the ability of any of us to know what's going to happen in the future. And if the OBR and the IFS and the Treasury and all the rest of them are so clever and so good at forecasting the future, why didn't they warn us about the recession that was going to hit us in 2008? What we need to do in this debate is look at where we are at the moment and we know the truth of the situation at the moment. We know what we have with the United Kingdom. We know we have austerity. We know we've come through a recession. We know we have the bedroom tax. We know there's more and more of that to come. That, these are facts. This is something that we can be very, very sure of. The Labour Party motion talks about Scotland being worse off financially if we go for independence. It basically says that we are currently, and have been for a long time, subsidy junkies. And not only does the Labour Party motion say that, it actually says that they, if it was true, and they believe it's true, I presume, they're not just kidding us on, but if it is true and they want us to remain as subsidy junkies, what does it say about their vision for the future? Does Boris Johnson know that the rest of the UK subsidises every single Scottish man, woman and child by, what was it Joanne Lamont said, £1,600 a year? What about the UK that is supposed to spread the load so that the richer parts help the poorer parts. Do the people in the north of England really subsidise us in Scotland? And does the Labour Party, is it really saying that they should continue to subsidise Scotland to the tune of £1,600 per person? The First Minister of Wales believes that we shouldn't. In a minute. The First Minister of Wales believes that we shouldn't. He wants the Barnet formula changed. He wants a cut in the Scottish budget of £4,000 million a year. So we can see where the Labour argument is going. So we can begin to look into the future and realise that what Labour is advocating isn't a future where Scotland is subsidised by the north of England and other poorer parts of the UK, who, by the way, are suffering because of London and the South East. It won't continue if it's true. And, of course, it isn't true. And they know it isn't true. Dr Simpson. Richard Simpson. I could perhaps enlighten him in the field of health that the north east of England actually received higher health funding than Scotland in two of the last five years. So there is a redistributive effect throughout the entire United Kingdom. Dave Thompson. And does the member support the redistribution of their alleged £1,600 per person to Scotland? Does the member uh, accept that that money should be redistributed from Scotland? Because the ultimate aim of their assertions about the rest of the UK is that everybody should be receiving the same across the whole of the UK. Because that's how you would balance the budget. That's how you would have fairness within the UK. So if the member doesn't accept, if he is saying that he wants Scotland, no, no thank you, if he wants Scotland to remain part of the UK so that we can get a higher level of funding than other parts of the UK, then I think their whole argument is based on a false premise. Scotland is a very, very wealthy 
country. Can I just read out one or two things to you? We have a £13 billion food and drink industry, a £7 billion financial services industry, £3 billion in life sciences, £6 billion in creative industries, £10 billion business services, £17 billion in construction, £9 billion in tourism, £9 billion in chemical sciences, £5 billion in aerospace, 4 and a half on whisky, and oh dear me, on top of all that, £1.5 trillion on oil and gas. And then we have 10% of Europe's wave energy potential and 25% of Europe's wind and tidal energy potential. Scotland is a wealthy country, but Scotland's wealth is not being spread out evenly across the country. The 10% at the top under the UK have 900 times the wealth close, of the 10% please. at the bottom. I want that changed. The members in Labour, the Liberal and the Tories obviously don't. Thanks so much. Now call on Richard Simpson to be followed by Rob Gibson. Dr Simpson, up to six Thank minutes. Thank you, Deputy please. Presiding Officer. I, I intend to actually talk mainly about health, but I can't resist actually saying uh, to Dave Thompson about the concept of redistribution. And if I may give him a further example, 40% of inheritance tax is actually paid within the London region and yet it is distributed across the whole of the United Kingdom. It is about taking in from where we are wealthy, and Scotland is now the fourth wealthiest region. We've moved up from eighth to fourth under devolution. Why would we want to jeopardize that? But if he doesn't understand the concept of redistribution, then I haven't the time to teach him today. <laughs> the challenges in health are for the Yes campaign to explain what possible advantages there are to patients through independence. The union provides many advantages which will be put at risk uh, 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 and will over time degrade our, our, our current advantage. Now, the NHS is fully devolved and has been so since, since the Parliament came into being. It's based on an approach which is now agreed across all five parties, that of collaboration and cooperation. We have our own highly respected medicines consortium, our evidence-based sign guidelines. We have higher levels of consultants. We have higher levels of nurses. We have higher numbers of beds. And all these are underpinned by the fact that we do receive more funds through the Barnet formula, as the northeast of England does, based on need. The Barnet formula wasn't based on need, but the continuation of it, because it was a formula that was expected to actually reduce us to even Stevens over the years, but actually it has moved to something different. Take an intervention. Thank Thompson. the member for taking the intervention. So can he tell me then which part of the UK gets less and is suffering because of the way things work that he thinks is so good? Richard Simpson. The, London gets less because London is wealthier. What do you not understand about the concept of redistribution? <laughs> now, the, re, the, re, the biggest challenge to Scotland's current preeminence in health will actually, from independence, will come about indirectly. Currently, we have five medical schools. This is far more than we require as a country. The students from England pay substantial tuition fees for medicine and indeed for all other forms of higher education. It adds to the bill that Ian Gray actually added up, and there are a few more figures to be added to it up. One of it is £140 million on university fees, which we will lose if we become independent because we will not be able to charge an independent EU country those fees. And over time, the Howitt, prediction, Howitt reports prediction that we should halve our medical student intake will happen, and we will have two fewer medical schools. Under the union, we've had five schools because we're part of the union. The current situation within the UK is also that Scotland punches massively above its weight in terms of medical research. It's competitive, and I stress the word competitive, research applications result in us getting 14% of the funds, £257 million from the UK Medical Research Council. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I must make some progress. I must make some progress. The, 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 the population share would only be 8.3%, and I think even the SNP have to accept that as a fact. The £83 million raised from UK Research Councils by the University of Edinburgh, of Edinburgh equals a third of its overall research council, uh, of its research income. Dundee, £21 million from the Scottish, research, Scottish Funding Council out of £121 million in research funds. So without 
the Medical Research Council is on a UK basis. We would have to pay for that ourselves. So you'll need to add that on to the bill in this fantasy land that we're being presented with. And this applies to the other 13 research councils. The other 13 research councils, we also punch well above our weight, 13% or so. Now, we might be able to afford that. Maybe we could. But we would not be winning these research applications in competition with the rest of the UK. And that means, over time, the quality of our research is likely to degrade. Similarly, I have no doubt, I have personally no doubt, that we will eventually gain entry to the, United, to the EU. But any delay in membership could interrupt the Horizon 2020 funding as well. So on research, the whole thing is a downside. Of course, the nationalists will promise to match that research funding, but again, we don't know quite where from. And if it doesn't just apply to the research councils, the Wellcome Foundation and other charities will not fund in the same way. And if you don't believe that, look what happened to ERA. When they pulled out, they lost Medical Research Council funding, and Wellcome only funds 50% of the projects in ERA, in ERA, not the 100% they do in Scotland. Uh, there are lots of other things which are, are on the downside. Uh, we would have to set up a whole raft of agencies. And the biggest disappointment to me is that we've had absolutely no indication of the costing of these. So do we set up a, a separate human tissue uh, uh, organization, a separate organ donation organization, separate health professional council, separate general, general medical council, separate general dental council, separate nursing and midwifery council. There are 277 agencies that we are going to have to set up on our own. And we have no idea from the SNP or the S campaign what the costs of these are going to be. So we are actually, when someone said earlier from the SNP side, a pig and a poke, it's a pig that is flying through the sky as far as the Yes campaign are concerned. It is utterly ridiculous. And then we come to the issues of why we do share. So, for example, one of the newest, one of the newest uh, uh, innovations is the proton beam therapy. The they cost between seconds. 50 and 100 million pounds each. They're going to be one in Manchester and one in London. If we're independent, we may still get access to them, but we will certainly not get access at marginal cost. It'll be at full cost. I have asked the Yes campaign and any speaker today to tell me one advantage, one advantage in health terms of being a separate and independent Scotland, because I cannot see them at all. Thanks very much. Now, Colin Rob Gibson to be followed by John Mason. Up well, to six minutes, please, Mr Gibson. Well, thank you, presiding um, officer. Uh, this debate, at its heart, is discussing how we should fund top-class public services. It's talking about ensuring a high level of investment in our schools, hospitals and public services in Joanne Lamont's motion. We also have amendments that are one-tax obsessions about oil, and they ignore the opportunities and the flexibility that there is if you talk about independence and the kind of taxation pol policies that an independent Scotland could contemplate. And uh, I, wa I want to return uh, to the offer made last Monday by uh, the uh, Unionist parties, because one of their great supporters, Ben Thompson, said, and the headline in the story was, taxing issue at the heart of devolution pro-union parties failed to address. And he said in the Herald, when people are looking for genuine vision, the pro-UK parties are in a position to offer it. But too often in politics, compromise is a byword for agreeing on the lowest common denominator. It would be tragic if that were the case here, as the lowest common denominator proposal would only give us an extra 5p on income tax with no welfare powers or permanence to the Scottish Parliament. Our country, he said, needs so much more. It needs so much more that we should use the ideas about independence and taxation to actually say how we can support these public services. And here are some ideas. I don't suppose in the days of uh, New Labour and its followers that they read the Jimmy Reid Foundation. Investing in a good society, five questions on tax and the common wheel is a document that contains suggestions that are carried out in a moderate way in many northern European countries and others. It's suggesting we need higher wages and from higher wages we get higher taxes. It talks about reducing tax evasion. Is it more easy in a small country than in the UK? Well, look at the success of the HMRC and ask yourself, could we do worse? to generate new tax and income from wealth, from land and property. 
And just think about the devolution offer at the present time in terms of tax. I deal with the rural economy. We've got the Scottish Affairs Committee in London suggesting that uh, we need to have reform of land reform, but they don't think that they can convince any UK government to end tax evasion, to stop tax havens, and they are arguing that that is not a possibility in the present circumstances. Labour is silent on these issues. When it talks about land reform, it has an empty coat. The, John, uh, the Jimmy Reid Foundation goes on to talk about generating greater income from Scotland's natural resources. Well, when you look at the way in which our natural resources, such as energy, have been mismanaged, we know that we can get more money from those and the tax from the development of those industries which have been denied to us by this current situation. That is why I would suggest that the reserve tax powers and the many arguments that we hear from uh, the uh, pro-union parties are never going to deliver for Scotland on the basis of that wealth that my colleague Dave Thompson talked about. And I'll take an intervention from Ian Gray. Ian Gray. I mean, I'm genuinely puzzled by this because the prospectus on which he stands and the government he supports intend to reduce the taxation that, for example, major energy companies provide. So how, how would that get us more tax from them? Well, you know, well, uh, you don't read the whole story, for example, in Ireland with a lower uh, corporation tax base. They're taking in far more than we are in Scotland at this particular time. But as the First Minister said in response to the way in which uh, the arguments of the pro-union parties have been put, with independence, we can design tax and economic policy to attract and maintain HQ functions to Scotland by implementing an industrial strategy for Scotland, by working together in a social partnership to improve wages and by tailoring policy to make the most of the huge comparative advantages that we have in key growth industries. The very industries I talked about earlier there when we are talking about the ways in which we can raise tax in an independent Scotland. So this obsession with trying to say we can't is based on the fact that you're not prepared to look at the opportunities which independence opens up. And that's why I think pitching in the Jimmy Reid Foundation remarks are one of the things which help us in this parliament to see that there is a better way, not better together, but better with independence. This debate today shows what a long and weary journey the unionists propose. On the 18th of September, we can start a voyage of opportunity with a yes vote, safe in the knowledge that Scotland has a sound economy and that can only be made fairer through independence. Many thanks. And I call on John Mason, after which we we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And uh, when I started looking at the, the wording of the Labour motion today, I have to say I thought some of the wording uh, was a little bit strange. So let's look at some of the wording. Uh, early on, it says that the best future for Scotland is one where its devolved public services are delivered by the Scottish Parliament. Well, presumably we all actually believe that, that devolved services should be delivered by the Parliament. But the question is, which services should be devolved? And I guess there are three options. Either it's the same services we have at the moment, or perhaps it should be fewer services, like education going to Westminster, as has been suggested by some of the Labour uh, people, or uh, perhaps it should be more powers. And if so, which powers should it be? I think this motion might have carried more weight today if there had been even a suggestion as to where devolution is actually going. I have seen billboards saying that more powers, more powers are, quote, guaranteed. Now, exactly what kind of guarantee is this? Is it written down somewhere? Was it in the Queen's speech? Or is this just an assertion with no actual substance? It seems to me a no vote is therefore hugely uncertain for all of us. There are probably three op options if there is a no vote. Firstly, things carry on much as at present because folk at Westminster are fed up thinking about Scotland. Secondly, sense prevails down south, 
People realise they have narrowly escaped losing Scotland and they hand over substantial new powers, for example, complete home rule, which I don't think actually Willie Rennie believes in nowadays, although his party used to. But that is, I think, what happens roughly in the Isle of Man, Jersey and Guernsey, where they do everything themselves except defence and foreign affairs. And presumably the third option is for the people down south say Scotland has had its chance, it's time to teach them a lesson, and we will cut their budget by £4 billion or whatever. Now, all of these are possibilities, but we really have no idea which would prevail. Presumably, there would be a debate on this within the three UK parties, or four if we include UKIP, and a lot might depend on the 2015 Westminster election. But for Scotland, voting no is a complete lottery. There is no certainty and no guarantees. At a couple of independence debates I have been at uh, recently, the example of Quebec has come up. There, there have been two no votes, and the uncertainty has gone on and on. At the very least, a yes vote would deliver certainty. We would all know exactly where we were, and we would get on with it. By contrast, after a no vote, uh, just a second, by contrast, after a no vote, uncertainty would continue, and that would be hugely damaging for investment and jobs. Rhoda Grant. Grant. Will, will the member um, at least acknowledge that the people in Quebec have rejected independence, have rejected another um, referendum and actually told the government, which was quite popular, um, decimated their vote because they were threatening another referendum. They're saying no to a referendum, as the people of Scotland will. The, the, people, the people of Quebec and every other uh, nation or province or anything have the right to make their own decisions. My point is that if you vote no, uncertainty continues. If you want certainty, the only way to have certainty is with a yes vote. Now, we have another phrase in the motion which talks about the UK being secure and stable. Well, is that an assertion or is, that, is there any evidence? Is there any evidence that the UK is strong and stable? The UK is clearly not strong on the world stage anymore, either militarily nor economically. What country with 1.5 trillion in debt, still increasing year by year, could actually be called strong or stable? It, well, I think Japan's got a few problems as well, and they've got a population problem too. It, it also talks the motion about pooling and sharing resources. Well, to be fair to the motion, what it actually says is we are allowed to pool and share resources, not that pooling and sharing resources is actually happening. Now, our members opposite telling me eh, are going to tell me that people in the east end of Glasgow who in the winter are having to choose between eating and heating are in some way benefiting from the pooling and sharing of resources. When rich companies and individuals pay little or no tax, pay expensive advisors so that they can pay even less tax, how is that pooling or sharing resources? Of course we should care about poorer people in Newcastle or Liverpool, or in Lisbon or Paris for that matter. But how does it help a poorer person in Glasgow to know that they are on the same boat as their counterpart down south? That is pooling poverty. It is not pooling resources. If we say to someone in dire straits in my constituency, yes, you could have, we could help you to have a better life, a proper minimum wage and better housing, but we need to hold you back in poverty because we can't also help all the other poor people in England and all around the world. How does that help anybody? Are we or are we not the Scottish Parliament? Does that not mean that we should be doing our best for the people of Scotland? Surely it does not mean we deliberately hold back the people of Scotland because we cannot help everybody else around the world. And it is arguable anyway whether the left in Scotland Presidente, might actually... I'm seconds. sorry, I've got running out of time last minute. It, and it is arguable anyway whether the left in England might actually benefit from Scottish independence. Yeah. This was a point which Tony Benn and Tariq Ali disagreed on. The weekend after Tony Benn died, Tariq Ali was in Glasgow, and I heard a fascinating interview with him on Radio Scotland. His argument is basically that if Scotland becomes independent, we have the opportunity to set an example to the rest of the UK to show how a socially just country can operate within the British Isles, and that could be a beacon example to the rest of the UK. So, presiding officer, I welcome the fact that we've had this debate this As afternoon. Close, I am disappointed that the Labour Party want to hold back the people of Scotland from a better future, and I am delighted to support the Government amendment. Many thanks. And well, now we move to closing speeches. I find myself once again reminding members that they should be in the debate for the closing speeches. Those who have taken part, Mr Rennie, six minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, we are often accused on this side of the debate of being negative, despondent, running down Scotland, not believing in the ability of the Scottish people 
to do more. But what we have heard, speech after speech, on that side of the chamber, is a tirade of negativity about the United Kingdom. A tirade. I heard John Mason there talking about a lottery, a debt, pooling poverty. I mean, how much more negative can you get? And to believe that somehow to draw a line on the map will automatically deal with those problems is naivety in the extreme and is something I would have thought better of John Mason. I like to be positive about the UK. I think those who have shared a platform with me will have heard me talk about the many positive reasons. And actually, I'm a convert to the referendum. I think there have been some benefits from us being able to explore the strengths and weaknesses of our nation. The fact that we can look at the things that I think we often take for granted. And I'll give you three positive reasons. First one is the shared currency, the single currency and the single market. That means we can trade right across the United Kingdom with limited barriers. Somebody who's doing their business in Ochtermachty can trade with somebody in Lansing in the southwest without limitations. We've also got an energy market that means that 30 million consumers across the UK can help us drive forward our renewable ambitions in Scotland and keep energy bills lower than they would otherwise be. An energy union that benefits everybody across these islands. And a research union that means the brilliant researchers in our Scottish universities, what, four or five of the top 200 in the world of the universities are here in Scotland. Those researchers get 50% more funding as a result of our pooling arrangements with the research councils across the UK. Now, I think they're positive reasons. I know they're positive reasons because the nationalists tell us so. Those are the things of the United Kingdom they want to keep. The, more and the longer we get into this campaign, the more things that they discover that are good about the United Kingdom. I wish sometimes the campaign would go on forever and then they might be eventually convinced about the absolute benefit of the United Kingdom. But I fear the campaign has been going on for too long eh, already. I'll take an intervention. McDonald. The, the fundamental problem is that Willie Rennie and often his colleagues on the no side mistake independence for isolationism. Independence is about choosing how you enter into relationships with other countries and cooperation with other countries on the terms that suit you and also the terms that suit them. Rennie. The impression is, that is created is that every other country around the world, including the rest of the United Kingdom, will agree to the nationalists every demand. Every single thing that they demand of them, they will automatically agree to. And the benefit of the United Kingdom means that we are locked in. We've got a guarantee that the good things about the United Kingdom are guaranteed to remain. His option, Mark McDonald's option, means that it is not guaranteed. They cannot demand of others the things that we have just now. All the great benefits of the United Kingdom, we'd be under threat as a result of his proposition. And Mark McDonald, I have to commend him for his work on carers. I genuinely do think he's done some, some great work on this. Um, but I'm sure he'll be disappointed by the white paper when he talks about welfare, because I've heard him many times in this chamber condemn the United Kingdom government for the £2.5 billion apparent cut in the welfare budget. But I've had a good look at the welfare proposals in the white paper, and there's not one more penny for welfare. Not one more penny is going to be spent in the first year of an independent Scotland. So, so much for this evil government imposing wickedness on Scotland. If they cared that much about it, then they would be increasing the welfare budget, not keeping it the same, the exactly the same as Ian Duncan Smith is proposing for the first year of independence as would be. And I kind of, I think Rob Gibson's intervention, Rob Gibson's speech um, was quite interesting because he showed the ability to face so many different ways at the one time. He talked about uh, the, Scandinavian, uh, the Scandinavian model of achieving Scandinavian services, but on American tax levels. That's the kind of contribution that he made. And he went on to praise the Irish corporation tax levels, not just cut by three pence, but they'd be halved if Rob Gibson would have his way. Now, I find that a bizarrely interesting contribution, and I'm not sh quite sure what the Jimmy Reid Foundation would make of it, because I'm sure they don't endorse cutting corporation tax in half eh, like Ireland has done. So I look forward to the next meeting of the Jimmy Reid Foundation to see what they're going to say about eh, Rob Gibson's ideal of a socialist Scotland. Um, 
But I think also John McAlpine's contribution was also uh, quite interesting. She talked about Samuel Johnson and all we needed to have is belief. Now, if we could solve all the problems in the world by belief, we would be in a much, much better place. But the world is a little bit more complex than that. Of course, we've got to be optimistic. Of course, we've got to believe we can change things. But we've got to look at the reality. And the one thing that is depressing about the SNP's offer on independence is that they are point blank refusing to set out what the first few days, first few years of independence would be like. We do not have any idea about the set up costs for independence. In fact, they're refusing to give any answers. They say it's too difficult to answer the question. You need to bring your remarks to close, Mr but, Rennie. But they're able to answer every single other question on the upside, never answer any difficult question. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Rennie. I now call on Gavin Brown. Mr Brown, you've got six minutes. Well, let me return to the Scottish Government's finance paper, which was published just a few short weeks ago. Because in referring to it in her opening speech, the Deputy First Minister said that we would grow the economy in an independent Scotland and that we have set out policies in the finance paper to show how we'd, we would grow the economy. Now, the paper does nothing of the sort. The paper claims, and the Scottish Government, of course, press release claimed that we would get an extra £5 billion a year in revenues by 2029-2030. $2.4 billion by increasing productivity by 2.5% every single year instead of 2.2%. That doesn't show you how you will grow the economy. All that says is that if you increase productivity by 2.5%, every year between now and 2029, then you would anticipate to get £2.4 billion extra a year by that point. That doesn't demonstrate at all how you might do it. They say that we would get an extra £1.3 billion a year by increasing the employment rate by 3.3 percentage points. But again, it doesn't demonstrate at all how you're going to increase the employment rate by 3.3 percentage points. It simply states that if you were to achieve that, then you would get an extra £1.3 billion a year. And the same about their comments on immigration. They don't explain how they are going to do it. They simply say that if you had higher immigration, we would get an extra £1.5 billion a year. They add them together to get a nice £5 billion figure. But it doesn't explain at all how you're going to do it. It simply says if these were actually to happen, then you might get an extra £5 billion a year by 2029 and 2030. I think it is about time the Scottish Government explained how they intend to do that. Do they have any ideas or suggestions on how they're going to do that? Or are we relying once again on pure assertion? Now, Mr Rennie, in his closing, talked about set-up and transition costings. And I think this is important too because again, it's something that the Scottish Government has shied away from on more than one occasion. There's an entire chapter in the white paper, pages 337 to 351, dedicated to transition, but not a single costing about how that might be done and the actual costs in setting up various bodies and departments. The official written position of the Scottish Government as per the white paper is left blank. Are we to assume that the setup and transition costs would be nil? We have the Scottish Government, they have the Cabinet Secretary saying that it would be too difficult to tell us what transition costs would be. And we had the First Minister um, in a statement to the press saying that about 250 million sounds about right. I don't know which one is the official Scottish Government position at this stage, but it's certainly not going to be 250 million pounds. I think there is a duty and an obligation on the Scottish Government to do their best efforts to let us know what is their best estimate of what a set-up and transition cost would be. The reason that the £250 million simply isn't credible is this. If you look at page 146 of the draft budget for 1415, there's a budget line for Scotland Act implementation, implementing the Scotland Act 2012, which the Scottish Government and which the SNP say is a marginal act an act which does very little uh, to give Scotland greater powers. But over the course of three years, implementing 
what they describe as a um, marginal act is going to cost 53.5 million pounds, according to the Scottish Government's own figures. If you look at the Scottish Government's own figures for the set-up costs of Police Scotland, turning eight police bodies into one, according to Audit Scotland, who took their figures from the financial memorandum of the Scottish Government, between 2011-12 and 2014-15, the total costs of implementing that reform would be £147 million. So between the setting up of Police Scotland and the implementation of the Scotland Act 2012, we are at the best part of £200 million. That is, that is why it is simply not credible to suggest that the set-up costs for an entire country would be in the region of £250 million. That is why I think we deserve answers from the Scottish Government on this absolutely critical question. Because John Swinney in his leaked paper said very clearly, undoubtedly, there will be a cost associated with setting up and running the necessary institutions, and in some cases, these are likely to be significant. He also said work is currently underway in finance to build a comprehensive overview of the institutions, costs and staff numbers, which I will draw together and provide an update to Cabinet on in June. If that was the right thing to do two years ago, then I asked the Scottish Government, why is it not the right thing to do now? Why are we not being given transition costs? So in closing, presiding officer, I reiterate what we said at the very start of this debate. We call on the Scottish Government to republish their financial paper with a central estimate for oil and a cautious estimate, not just the optimistic estimate. And we ask again that they publish transition and set up costs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I now call on John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary. I can give you nine minutes. Presiding officer, I thought Mr. Rainey made um, a, a strange remark for somebody who is supposed to be an advocate of devolution, and as he would have it in this debate, an, uh, a, a, an advocate of further devolution or, or, or double devolution, as uh, Sarah Boya characterised it. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to find out what double devolution happens to be. But Mr. Rennie said that um, the position of the government was essentially that you could draw a line on a map and think that problems can be sorted. And if, that's, if, if Mr. Rennie takes that view and thinks that that's not the way that we should proceed in policy terms, then why on earth is this parliament here? Why have we got responsibility for health? Because, crucially, because the line has been drawn on the map and we have that control, we're able to do things differently in Scotland on health, which I don't think any of us in this, uh, in this parliament disagree that we should be doing things differently on health because none of us would want to go down the route on health care policy that the United Kingdom government is currently embarking. But of course I'll give way to Mr. Well, Ray. The Mr. is that he is saying that by separating off, by not having a pooling of resources anymore, that suddenly we'll be able to solve all the problems that his colleagues have highlighted today. I believe that local decisions are good decisions, but partnership is a good thing as well. That's something he seems to ignore. But see, that, that brings me on to the next point that I want to make, which is uh, well, it's well seen where that was roundly endorsed from. Um, when that, it brings me on to the next issue I want to raise, which is about an issue like the bedroom tax, for example. Uh, a line on the map has been drawn, and we've addressed the implications of the bedroom tax in Scotland. Mr Rennie even voted for the budget to support that. And if Ms Mara wants to make an intervention rather than mutter, then we'll have an intervention. But if she's just muttering, we'll leave her to mutter in the corner. So, back to Mr Rennie, who voted for the budget on the basis that we had tackled a number of issues, one of which was tackling the bedroom tax, which was also supported by my muttering colleagues over in the Labour Party into the bargain. And what the point, and point well, let me, let, me, let me develop this point. And what that says to me is that there is a different policy position and attitude here in Scotland that we want to resolve in this Parliament that takes us in a different direction to the rest of the United Kingdom. And we should be able to do that on all of the issues that concern us as a Parliament. We're able to do it on health. 
We were able to find it, and eventually by successful negotiation by the Deputy First Minister, to get there on the bedroom tax. But why should we not be able to do that on a whole range of other issues? And I'll give away to Mr Green, Ingrid. if he wants in there. Uh, on the face of it, I agree with much of what Mr Swinney is saying, and that we did support his budget on the basis of the action that we agreed he would take against the bedroom tax. But I can't miss the opportunity to ask him why we're now three months past the point where he agreed he would have dealt with the bedroom tax, made the money available to local government, and made sure nobody was paying it, and he still hasn't put the system in place yet. Well, well as, as usual, Mr Gray walks into the brick wall that I put in front of him. The reason, the, reason why, the reason why we cannot put all of the provisions through this Parliament is we're waiting for Westminster to allow us to do so. That's the nub of the problem, Mr Gray. Of course, if you want to slap into another brick wall, here we go. Ian Gray. I sat in Mr Swinney's office and we agreed an alternative way in which the outcome we both wanted could be achieved. If he chooses... If he chooses... If he prefers the constitutional grievance to helping the poor tenants suffering the bedroom tax, that's his choice. There is Mr. Swinney. There is not a single local authority in the country that is limited in its ability to tackle the bedroom tax today. There is a legislative process that's got to be completed, upon which we are dependent on Westminster to take forward. And I gave Mr Gray the assurance that we would abolish the bedroom tax in Scotland by the route that was reliable and dependable, and that's precisely what this government is going to do. Now, that brings me on to uh, one of the points that uh, Joan McAlpine raised, which was where she questioned the notion that's been running through this debate about the offer of security and stability in the United Kingdom. And it's a similar issue to the bedroom tax issue because on the information that's available to the government now through the publications of the Child Poverty Action Group, it is estimated that as a consequence of UK welfare reform, the number of children in poverty is going to increase in Scotland by 100,000, undoing the achievements that have been made over a number of years to remove children from poverty. And according to the Better Together argument, we should just shrug our shoulders and say, well, that's the, that's the price of the union. That's what we get from these issues being determined by Westminster. So the, the, the whole argument for me is about whether we're prepared to sit in this parliament and debate these issues or whether we're going to acquire the powers to do something about these issues. To coin a phrase from Mr Gibson in his contribution, from Rob Gibson, eh, to tackle the obsession with what we can't do, which is the obsession of the UK parties in this debate. Scotland is capable. Scotland is capable of resolving these issues and determining a better future. Now, both Mr Gray and Mr Brown have said that they've set out arguments about the papers that we've produced and said that we haven't evidenced what measures we would take to try to improve economic performance. Well, let me set out a few of them. We've set out that we would use the tax powers that come with independence to support innovation, to encourage and incentivise tax credits for research and development, to ensure that we can create higher value employment and economic opportunities in Scotland. We've said that we would uh, provide more effective capital allowances to encourage investment in manufacturing companies where there is a lack of activity uh, in the UK perspective. We've set out the approach we would take on encouraging new export initiatives to support small companies to get active in the international markets. We've set out our proposals for the reintroduction of post-study work visas to encourage trained people from around the world to live here in Scotland. And of course, all of these measures fit into the uh, projections that we set out as a government about improved economic opportunity that would come about. Uh, as we've set out in the financial projections paper, uh, I will do, yes, sir. Mr. Can Brown. he tell the Chamber why has he only set out one oil scenario on which his entire financial paper rests? I, haven't I, I don't know what papers Mr. Brown is reading, but I've got a paper in front of me, and there's six oil scenarios on page 13 of the Oil and Gas Bulletin. Can't he read and get to elementary contributions to the parliamentary debate? Now, on the, uh, the, the point I was making to Mr Gray and Mr Brown about economic improvements, a 3.3% increase in Scotland's employment rate 
could boost Scottish tax receipts by £1.3 billion. We have increased Scotland's employment rate uh, since, in, the, in the period running up to uh, January uh, to March 2014 by 3.5 percentage points over the period four years previously. Population numbers, Mr Gray was poking fun at us about population numbers. The 10-year average increase in net migration in Scotland is 22,000. The government's projections are based on 24,000. It is a modest enhancement of the existing net migration levels that we have into Scotland. Is not Mr Gray following the debate in this respect? Now, one final comment to address one of the points that Richard Simpson made, which was about not one single advantage for health being set out by my colleagues as a consequence of independence. Let me give them one very clear example. If a UK government decides to continue to slash, well, it's not if they decide to slash public expenditure in the future, the Labour Party and the Conservatives and the Liberals are all signed up to austerity to slash public expenditure in the United Kingdom. What will that do? As a consequence of the Barnett formula, it will reduce the block grant in Scotland, put further pressure on health and education. That's the price of staying in the United Kingdom. We need to get out of austerity and we need to use the resources of Scotland for the maximum benefit of the people of our country. Thank you. I now call on Drew Smith to wind up the debate. Uh, Mr Smith, I would be obliged if you would continue until five o'clock. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This has been a, a warm afternoon and some contributions have certainly benefited um, from the heat. Over the last um, two years and indeed since I, before I came here in 2011, I've often reflected uh, on the question which will finally be answered by the Scottish people in September. And one of the most fascinating things I have found is the need for those who support independence um, to explain to themselves, but particularly uh, to those of us who are saying no thanks, why we hold the view that we do. And we're told by the Nationalists, and Nicola Sturgeon um, set out more of this this afternoon, repeated the same old lines, that it must be because we don't understand the issues. We haven't thought enough about independence. It must be because anyone who believes in the UK must be a Tory, or because they've been told to do so by someone else in London, or is it simply because we're all too fear? And none of this, um, and I'm sorry to disappoint, is actually the truth. Because in any debate, it's useful to examine the arguments of the other side and to try to understand why people disagree with you, rather than to characterise their position for them or to abuse them for holding it. And in terms of characterising others' position, I don't think we'll ever have a better example than the speech that we had this afternoon from Chick Brodie. Um, it said that nationalists want Scotland to be a normal country, and that that means we must be independent. But Scotland's already a normal country, and we can choose to continue to be a normal country that works together um, with our closest neighbours. Uh, neither, side, the, neither side of this campaign has got a monopoly on normal people who support their view. Mothers and carers who support union over independence are normal, and indeed all the polls tell us that they are the majority. Now, I oppose independence fundamentally because I don't believe it will be in the best interests of Scotland or of the rest of the UK and specifically for the people that I'm in politics to try and represent. I suspect that many people who take the opposite view from me actually do so for identical reasons. The same motivation, but the opposite conclusion. And that's where the political debate should be. So the case that Labour have put before the Parliament and the issues highlighted in Joanne Lamont's motion take us to the fundamentals, whether or not ordinary people will be better or worse off. And that shouldn't be based solely on an economic, an economic analysis, but it is the territory where I think politicians most usefully assist the public who are, after all, going to be the decision makers in all of this. So the debate does need to be returned to the issues of substance rather than simply imagining answers to questions that were never asked, uh, building up straw men, as, as Mark Macdonald um, did, and slogans and promises um, without price, price tags. There are very real and serious questions which those who promote independence have completely failed to answer on the currency, most notably, but on Europe, public finances and jobs too. And Annabel uh, Goldie made the point, asking these questions isn't negative. And denying that these questions are important or asserting that definitive answers have already been given when they haven't, it just isn't helpful. When the questions are denied or diverted, it leads the rest of us to the conclusion that for some, independence is desirable whether or not it makes Scotland a better place. It suggests that many of the things that are put forward as reasons for independence are not actually reasons at all. Uh, instead, it is independence that is the reason for the policies which this government promotes. And I understand that nationalism might not be the starting point of everyone uh, who supports a yes vote, but I suspect it is still a, 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 a major driver for many in the SNP. And Scotland free, no matter what, no matter the cost, is a view that I fundamentally find 
unattractive. It leads me to the worry that when it comes to the detail, too many of the policies are not properly worked out at all, and to the concern that some on the yes side will in fact say anything to get over the line in September. Um, I, I, and we've seen more of that this afternoon. I mean, I think the, 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 the Trident Funding Pledge Prize um, that has become, uh, uh, become a part of every one of these debates has to go to, to George Adam who, today, who told us that what was apparently announced as a self-funding childcare policy um, is now to be funded um, by cutting Trident. Now, I want to turn to some of the other issues that have been, uh, that have been raised this afternoon. Members like Kezia Dugdale and Richard Simpson and Sarah Boyack, who have set out their concerns about public services, should Scotland decide to end devolution and the basis on which we pool and share our resources across the whole of the United Kingdom. Members on this side have argued that Scotland can enjoy the best of both worlds with a strong Scottish Parliament focused on both the defence and improvement of our public services, while also being backed up by the strength and security of being part of a partnership with England, with Wales and with Northern Ireland, certainly. Mark Macdonald. The member accuses others of empty slogans, yet he's just trotted out best of both worlds and pooling and sharing resources. Can you tell me the people who live in poverty just now in Scotland are at the sharp end of welfare reform? Which worlds exactly do they have the best of both of? Bruce Smith. I, I think no one is denying that, that um, slogans can be helpful in, in politics. The problem is that when your politics is only a slogan. Um, the evidence that we've heard from many of the experts uh, who have looked at Scotland, pu Scotland's public finances have told us two things, presiding officer. First, that an independent Scotland would begin from a worse financial position than the rest of the UK. And secondly, if our existing public services are to be maintained, never mind the many uh, uh, promises which have been made for how much better everything else will be, then we will either need to make cuts, raise taxes or both. Um, the IF IFS. So our calculations suggest that independent Scotland could, be, could expect to be running a deficit of around 5% of GDP in 2016-17, which would be larger than that facing the UK as a whole and would necessitate tax rises and spending cuts. Uh, CPPR, there will be a net fiscal loss under independence looking into the future. Citigroup, with the recent drop in oil revenues, Scotland's fiscal deficit is now significantly above UK levels. Pensions Policy Institute has said a future Scottish Government would need to raise tax, cut spending or accept higher, uh, uh, or, uh, accept higher borrowing. So Joanne Lamont was absolutely right. There is an arithmetic and a credibility gap. Firstly, between what the Scottish Government claim about the public finances of an independent Scotland and most of the other independent assessments. And secondly, between the promises which are made which would entail more spending and the money which is to be raised to pay for them. So we've got no credible costings for a radical expansion of welfare benefits, no long-term costings on childcare. Allegedly, no costings work has been done at all on the expenses of setting up the institutions of a new country. And at the same time, the Government has pledged no rises in personal taxation and cuts in corporation tax. The Scottish Government's own much-admired Professor Stiglitz has said about that policy, some of you have been told that lowering tax rates on corporations will lead to more investment. The fact is that is not true. It is just a gift to the corporations increasing inequality in our society. And I think I would rather prefer uh, Joseph Stiglitz's uh, his lectures on redistribution to, than to that which we heard from Dave Thompson. So Labour have, taught, have today sought to debate the risks to our public services, uh, which we believe exist because of the government's um, failure to present a case for independence, which adds up. The experts are saying that our uh, the experts are saying that our fiscal position will be worse because of independence. The experts are saying that taxes will have to go up or services will need to be cut. We know that there will be set-up costs, costs associated with independence. We know that there are costs associated with the policy promises which the Scottish Government are still making. Yet we are told everything will be better, more money will be spent, and we will pay for it by cutting taxes for big business. It's difficult to believe what the SNP are saying. And since the line does appear to be say anything, it is easy to deduce that they don't believe it themselves either. Because if we take them at their word, the only common sense conclusion is that the costs will have to be paid elsewhere, schools, hospitals or other public services. Following the most recent downgrading of oil revenue estimates, the independent experts are predicting a bigger fiscal gap 
in the first year of independence. And I have heard nothing this afternoon that, that explains to me why it is that all these independent experts are, are maliciously making uh, these estimations. It is just extraordinary. There are many points to be debated on the pros and cons of independence. In terms of the debate, there is a variety of interesting legal arguments to, po to pour over. Uh, there are those like Joan McAlpine who will be fascinated and excited by the business of draft constitution uh, writing. There are those who are already with the Scottish Government, who passionately believe that Scotland should be free, no matter what, no matter the costs. But there are many more who are looking for a real debate about what independence would mean for them, for their families, for their jobs, for their local hospital or the school that their child attends. So, as Parliament approaches our summer recess, President Officer, Labour will continue to seek, uh, will continue to, seek to convince others of our view that Scotland is better off in the UK, working with others, pooling and sharing our resources. We will put the positive case for partnership, arguing that we can have the best of both worlds, and we will do it for, the simple, for simple reasons which should be, should be simply understood even by those who disagree with us. Because we don't need to spend time worrying about how to put a currency union back together when we have one at the moment. We don't need to worry about how to get back into the EU when we have the most preferential terms of membership already. We don't need to worry about asking the Bank of England to be our lender of last resort when already taxpayers across the UK have stood behind the Scottish banks. We don't need presiding officer to agonise, agonise over how to create a new social union when we can already stand with other progressive people in London, in Belfast and in Cardiff and argue for the real political changes we want to see for Scotland and for Britain. And as Ian Gray spelled out, we don't need to put at risk our public services on a prospectus that simply does not add up. Presiding officer, we can do something better than that. We can decide for ourselves to work together with others rather than to break free of them. We can self-determine to be willing partners in a union which, if it has faults, then we have helped to make them. If it can be made better, then we can resolve to do that too. It is for these reasons that Scottish Labour is urging Scotland to vote no in September. Presiding officer, and I urge Parliament to support the motion in the name of Joanne Lamont this afternoon. That concludes the debate on Scotland's future. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 10355 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, which sets out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10355. Moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 10355, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10357 and 10358 on designation of lead committees. Moved on block. The question on these motions will be put decision time. There are six questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that in relation to this afternoon's debate, if the amendment in the name of Nicholas Surgeon is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie falls. The first question then is amendment number 10353.3 in the name of Nicholas Sturgeon, which seeks to amend motion number 10353 in the name of Joanne Lamont, on Scotland's future, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10353.3 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon is as follows. Yes, 67. No, 53. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to and the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie falls. The next question is amendment number 10353.2 in the name of Gavin Brown which seeks to amend motion number 10353 in the name of Joanne Lamont on Scotland's future, 
be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10353.2 in the name of Gavin Brown is as follows. Yes, 53. No, 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10353 in the name of Joanne Lamont as amended on Scotland's future be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10353 in the name of Joanne Lamont as amended is as follows. Yes, 66. No, 54. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10357 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on designation of a lead committee be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10358 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the designation of a lead committee be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.